This video lecture is the last of the series of video lectures on Rene Descartes' theory of knowledge. It presents the last three parts, that is, Meditations 4 to 6 of Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. Now, the first two parts of this series of video lectures on Descartes' theory of knowledge are titled Rene Descartes' Theory of Knowledge, Part 1, The Discourse on the Method, and Rene Descartes' Theory of Knowledge, Part 2, Meditations on First Philosophy, Meditations 1 to 3. Links of these video lectures are in the description box below. Don't forget to check them out. And now let's proceed. Meditations on First Philosophy Meditation 4. On Truth and Falsity In the third meditation, Descartes was certain that God is perfectly good. However, if God is perfectly good, how then is error or falsity possible? Well, according to Descartes, everything that God created is perfect. But God created humans as finite beings whose finitude still leaves room for error. Descartes illustrates this point in this way. We have God, who is absolutely perfect, humans, who are less perfect than God but more perfect than other beings, and lesser form of beings. But why didn't God create humans as perfect beings so that humans would not err? Well, according to Descartes, God could have willed it. God could have created humans as perfect beings. But according to Descartes, man cannot fathom the mystery of God. Hence, God's motives and reasons for creating humans as imperfect beings are incomprehensible. Now, what about the origin of truth? How certain is Descartes about the existence of the I? What if God deceives him? Well, here, Descartes brought again the demon problem. According to Descartes, since God is perfectly good, then he cannot deceive us. This is because if God deceives us, then he is not God, because to deceive someone is an act of an imperfect being. Therefore, Descartes is certain about the existence of truth, of the I, because God as a perfect being would not deceive us. What this implies is that God cannot be the source of error. Now, if God is not the source of error, then who is responsible for the existence of error or falsity? Well, for Descartes, the concepts of intellect and will are the keys to answering this question. According to Descartes, both the intellect and will are gifts from God. Descartes argues that the intellect, as the faculty of knowledge, cannot be the source of error. Because the intellect simply perceives ideas, it cannot err. It must be noted that for Descartes, the intellect allows us to perceive ideas only. It does not make judgments. And this is because judgments are the business of the will. Now, since it is judgments that can either be true or false, and that since judgment is the primary function of the will, then, according to Descartes, it is the will that is the source of error. It is the will that commits mistakes. And how is this possible? Well, according to Descartes, when the will, which is the faculty of choice or freedom of the will, passes judgments on matters that are not clearly understood, error comes into the fore. What this implies at the end of it all is that, to avoid error in judgment, as Descartes would have us believe, it must be guided by reason or the intellect. Meditations on First Philosophy, Meditation 5, on the essence of material objects and more on God's existence. It must be noted that God is reconsidered in Meditation 5. Meditation 5 is also a transition to a more important sixth meditation. Now, one of the central points in Meditation 5 is Descartes' attempt to know whether material things exist independently of the mind. But because Descartes has put the testimony of the senses in doubt, then Descartes just see these material things. In other words, Descartes simply observes these things. 
Thus, Descartes resorts to the intellect and consider more carefully the idea of these things, which is all that is available to him. However, it should be noted that Descartes postponed the discussion on whether material things exist in reality outside of the mind until the sixth meditation, and instead discussed what he thought as the third proof of God's existence. Meditation 5, therefore, is devoted to the discussion of the discovery of the third proof of God's existence. Now, Descartes argues that clear and distinct ideas have a nature or essence of themselves, and for Descartes, this necessarily implies existence. Since our idea of God is clear and distinct, Descartes concludes that, indeed, God exists. Descartes illustrates this argument this way. God, by definition, is a being of infinite perfection. Existence is a perfection, for everything that exists is perfect, otherwise it cannot exist. Therefore, God exists. Meditations on First Philosophy, Meditation 6 on the existence of material objects and the real distinction of mind and body. We know that since the intellect conceives some things clearly and distinctly, some things necessarily exist, therefore. Now the question is, what is our proof that these things really exist in reality? Or how do we know that indeed material things exist? Put differently, we know that the essence of material things is extension. In other words, all things are extended. Hence, to be a thing is first to have size and shape, second to endure, and third to be movable and changeable. Now, are they any? To answer these questions, Descartes initially offers the discussion on the dynamics of the imagination as proof. But Descartes thought that, although the imagination can produce images of reality, it cannot be a strong proof to the existence of material things. This is why Descartes turns to the senses. Indeed, Descartes perceives that he has a body that exists in the world, and this body can experience pain, pleasure, hardness, and the like. And this body can perceive other bodies with extension, shape, movement, hardness, heat, color, smell, taste, and the like. Now, Descartes was convinced that these perceptions all come from outside sources, and that these perceptions come to us involuntarily. It is clear that since material things exist, it is logical to suppose that the source of sensory ideas in some way resembles the ideas themselves. Hence, for Descartes, all knowledge comes from without, via the sense. But isn't it that for Descartes, the senses are unreliable sources of ideas and knowledge? In fact, Descartes insists in the earlier discussion of the meditations, as well as in the discourse, that we should not rely on the senses, because they only deceive us. Well, Descartes seemed to have changed mind here. According to Descartes, the situation is now very different from the first meditation. For Descartes now knows that God, who created these material things, exists and is not a deceiver. Therefore, those material things that are perceived by the mind via the senses exist in reality. Descartes illustrates his argument this way. I have a strong inclination to believe in the reality of the material things that I seem to sense. To put it differently, their independent reality seems to be one of the things I am taught by nature. God must have created me with this inclination. Now, if material things do not exist independently, then God must be a deceiver. But God is not a deceiver. So, material things exist with those properties I conceive to be essential to them. Final Note on the Discussion Between Mind and Body for Descartes, mind and body are both substances, 
and so they are completely distinct from each other. On the one hand, mind is a non-extended thinking thing. On the other hand, body is an extended non-thinking thing. Now, part of the reason why Descartes aims to establish the distinction between mind and body is to establish the fact that the soul is immortal. As we can see, the distinction between mind and body opens up the possibility of establishing the immortality of the soul, since it involves the idea that the decay of the body does not imply the destruction of the soul. But how does Descartes prove the crucial claim that the mind and body are capable of existing apart from each other? Here, Descartes invokes what he calls, first, clear and distinct conception of the mind as a thing that is complete and does not require any extended qualities in order to exist. And second, the corresponding clear and distinct conception of the body not requiring any mental properties in order to exist. Now, as we can see, Descartes' real distinction argument turns on the reliability of so-called clear and distinct perception. However, Descartes didn't give a concrete example of a mind existing apart from the body and a body existing apart from the mind. Now, despite the real distinction between the mind and body, Descartes argues that these substances nevertheless interact with each other. According to Descartes, the mind causes certain changes in the body and the body in the mind. But when asked about the specificity of this interaction, Descartes was unable to answer and instead appeal to God. In Descartes' understanding, God sets up or institutes those particular causal relations between mind and body that are, in general, the most conducive to the well-being of the composite of mind and body. Descartes illustrates, God can create anything that I can clearly and distinctly conceive, there being no impossibility in it. If God can create one thing independently of another, the first thing is distinct from the second. I have a clear and distinct idea of my essence as a thinking thing. So, God can create a thinking thing, a soul independently of the body. I also have a clear and distinct idea of my body as an extended thing, its essence. So, God can create a body independently of a soul. So, My soul is a reality distinct from the body, so I, as a thinking thing or soul, can exist without my body. Now, at the end of the meditations of the first philosophy, Descartes was convinced that he has achieved his main objective. Skepticism and solipsism have been defeated, and the basic structure of reality has been clearly delineated namely, God, souls, and material things. Descartes also concluded that reality is composed of infinite substance and two kinds of substances, thinking and extended substances. Finally, Descartes believes that he has successfully shown that indeed knowledge is possible, that contrary to the position of the skeptics, the human mind can attain knowledge.